Hi, my name is Juan Wezar, president of Sage Real Estate, your fourplex market leader and your highest rated multifamily broker here in the city of Long Beach. And welcome to our investor highlight series where we are gonna learn from the best real estate investors that are doing it here in our backyard. We're gonna ask the right questions so that we can bring their knowledge and deliver it to you so that you could become a better investor. And today for our investor series highlight, we have a very special guest, Andy Dane Carter. Who's Andy Dane Carter? So he's a social media icon, but more than that, he's a real estate broker. Uh, he owns several businesses throughout Southern California. He's an author, wrote a terrific book talking about real estate investment. He's a sought out speaker. He is a powerhouse, well known here in the community, and we have so much to learn from him and how he views real estate investing. I'm very excited to share this interview with you. Without further ado, let's get into it. Andy Dane Carter has this uh, tremendous background of real estate investing, real estate business. I know you own a local restaurant, you're an entrepreneur, you're, you're an influencer, and so you set the bar super, super high for all of us, right? And there's so much we can learn from you. But like today, the one thing that we're gonna focus this show on is real estate investing. Yep. So we wanna learn from you. And so let's, let's kick this off. So the first question when you, I guess the first thing that I wanna know is when you got started in real estate investing, like who got you started? Who told you about it? Like what motivated you to take the first steps? And like, I'm gonna buy this, whether it's a house, whether it's a flip or a duplex, what was it? Sure, so I have a crazy backstory. Um, but when I got into real estate, I hadn't worked in about a year and a half. I was teaching yoga here in Long Beach. I was racing triathlons. Um, I just lost like 65 pounds because I was coming off of this like crazy career, corporate grind, and I took a pause on my life. And so I had a really good friend of mine whose home in Naples burnt down, so he was living with me. Mm -hmm. and. He was an investor, he was a flipper here in Long Beach. So he's like, hey, have you ever thought about doing real estate? You're a smart guy, you've owned businesses and teams and companies. What about real estate? And you can still do all this like hippie yoga stuff and race your bike and do all this other stuff. And I was like, huh, maybe I'll give it a shot. So I go in my backyard, huge, like, like you know, fire and bonfire. And I go into a meditation and I just get this, yes. And I was like, okay. I go in my house, sign up for the real estate course, I get my license, and I went to go work for his little firm for free at like 30 years old. I'm now 44. I had about 400 bucks left in the bank because I'd burned through all of my money and we started to flip houses. They were already flipping houses in the tune of about, about 20 a year. We scaled that very quickly to about 160 a year and I got really good on the phones and really good at getting deals. So I became a deal junkie very fast. Andy, so talk to us like, so what was the role that you were playing for the company and what were you learning? It was like the whole thing from the ground up. I looked at the multiple listing service like it was a different language. I was like, I'm never gonna be able to learn all this. This is so overwhelming. So I just basically locked myself in that office for like a few days and just learned that. And I learned really quickly that I needed to get deals. Deals was the thing that was hurting us. We were going to the auction and we were bidding against everybody else. That's when the hedge funds were coming in, like, like you know, 2000, you know, 9, 10, 11. So we scaled really, really quickly on how to make me like an acquisitions specialist. So I became a savage. Like I wasn't married, didn't have any kids yet. And I was just like, I would work 16 to 18 hours a day and get these deals, drive all over LA and just start to vet deals and find ones that were good. So, so let's talk about it because a lot of people are gonna to wanna to say, well, how did you find these deals? And what made something a deal? That's probably the number one question. Is it, was, it was a totally different market back then. Yeah. A absolute knucklehead that knew nothing about real estate could crush the industry. Like it was that easy. Right. You, you go to the auction, you buy a house for 210, you put 30 grand into it, and then you make 100 on the exit over and over and over again. Now this was on the recovery. This is on the recovery side. So yeah, this is 2009, 10, 11, 12. And then we started to realize this is a lot of work. And I was like, how about we start buying buildings? Mm -hmm. So on these long bike rides that I used to go on, I would listen to these investing books on tape yeah. from like all the best investors, all the big gurus, all the people that were actually doing it correctly. Then I got around some really wise old mentors that all they, all they messed with was multifamily real estate. And all of a sudden these numbers started to make sense to me. And I'm like, what are we doing flipping houses, working our faces off, paying short term cap gains, getting our heads kicked in every year. So I start taking all these commission checks from the buy side act for the company, plus all of my splits with them in return to start buying 
duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes, and then we started to buy bigger buildings, and I kept mine. I right. continue to keep mine. Wait, so, so let's go back to, uh, you know, you said that during that time, any knucklehead, but listen, I was in the, in, the, in the real estate industry during that time. I saw the peaks, I saw the valleys, mm. and there was a scary moment of, oh my gosh, how long is the recovery gonna take? So mm. although you, you, For may, sure. you, you For might sure. make it seem like it was easy, I would say, I would say that you guys were taking risk, right. and it was, now looking back, we knew that it was gonna come back fast, right. but in the middle of it, even when I was you know, trying to convince my friends like, hey, this is the bottom, this is where, this is, or, here's what I would tell people. I would tell my friends, let's partner up, let's get, let's get a good loan, mm -hmm. uh, everything is cash flowing in the city of Long Beach, because at that moment, it legitimately was, agreed, right? Agreed, mm -hmm. And uh, I said, this is where millionaires are made, and I said that right. over and over and over and over, but it was hard to convince people, because why? Right. Because, because rents actually for the first time had dropped in the city of Long Beach, mm -hmm. values were low, and at that point, there was like no, I remember being there and trying to convince them like, hey, we're gonna recover, and they're like, at what time, and I didn't know the future, right? So we're having right. this conversation. Now, ultimately, it recovered faster, but I wasn't able to convince enough friends to pick up enough buildings. All I saw was opportunities. I agree. And uh, so, so kudos to you where, I mean, I know you said that it was kind of easy and anyone could have made it. it. It was still kind of a tricky time to make money. It was a very tricky time. For me, it was just, it was like a perfect storm because I had nothing to measure it against. I was like, that's a great deal. I didn't know how long it was gonna take because I had nothing to measure it against. Right. So I was like, it was all just gut for me and a little bit of luck went a long way sure. as we start to buy more and more. We were buying like these humongous flat swaths of land and closing them all cash because we didn't know any better until I sat down with like a real builder yeah. and they're like, no, you tie it up for a year, you get it entitled and then you sell it off or you just build it. I'm like, what? We're just buying them like flip. I did everything like a flip. That was my like entire model. Yeah, yeah. So for me, it was the same thing. I just, there was so much fun for me because I didn't really know that it was going to take two years. I didn't know it was going to take a year. I was just kind of in it. Sure. And I just got, again, I got lucky. And Long Beach is just a, I mean, there's a, yeah. There's a lot here. And, you know, and I think if you take the risks, right, mm -hmm. and that's what you've been doing. You, right. you take the risk, you've been opening the, the, your own doors. No one's mm -hmm. opening the door for you. Like, so luck will, will, uh, will come into play once you take that risk. But if right. you take no risk, there's, there's no luck that's going to that's gonna support you or help your growth. You went from flipping houses to mm -hmm. multifamily investing. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about, so when you look at an apartment building, a smaller apartment building, mm -hmm. what is it that you look for? Like what is important for you to decide, I want to buy that? Yeah, so for me, it's like the basics. I look for a little bit, you know, of like deferred maintenance, probably been owned by like a mom and pop operator, small little family, maybe they own three or four properties total. Mm -hmm. They've kept the rents really low, so I have a lot of opportunity. One of my favorite things is the gross rent multiplier, so go look that up on YouTube if you don't know what that is yet. Understand a cap rate, super important. And I just look for those little things. I like buying buildings that are tenant occupied. I like them when they're already there, they've been there for a long time. We've bought plenty of buildings now where I can tell if it's like a good tenant mix, if it's a bad tenant mix, I've literally dealt with everything in between. We like the C and B markets. I don't like the A plus markets, never have. I don't like the D and F markets for the obvious reasons. Yeah. But that little sweet spot of those like D plus C minus areas, they just crush. So in the city of Long Beach, what, what would you consider right now? And obviously you've been doing this for, for years now and obviously the, the gross rent multiplier changes, right? <laughs> so right now, right now, Andy, what, what is a good, so in, in the places that you would invest, what's a good current gross rent multiplier that you're like, okay, if it's at this uh, you know, GRMX, I'll buy it. Right, it kind of depends on the building. So I'm super old school where it literally depends on the deal. What's my plan for the deal? Is it a two year hold to exchange it? Is it gonna go from a four to an eight? What is my plan? Where's the market at right now? Yeah. I've been going really slow the past two years. I thought for sure this market would have already corrected sure. by now. Sure. I've been wrong for two straight years. But at the same time, I mean, I was going so fast in the beginning, now I'm going much, much slower per my mentors. I like the, well, and then here's the other caveat is we now have statewide rent control, right? So there's only certain things we can and can't do. That has also helped me buy a lot more because you have these seasoned landlords that have owned it for 20 plus years or whatever, they fully depreciated the asset they might be ready to just get out. 
So they look at somebody like me to buy it. So like, like there's not just a singular formula. Right. It's super, super deal specific. That's what I tell all my clients as well. A lot of times people will reach out to us and will say, Juan, when, when do you know it's a good deal? That's right. right. And so we created our, our, our actual formula. And one of those formulas obviously is going to have the cap rate and the gross rent multiplier. Sure. And so here's the best way that I could describe the gross rent multiplier. So when we do like an analysis on a property, I tell the, our clients, hey, there, this is a two prong approach. Mm -hmm. There's going to be the market analysis that's mm -hmm. going to tell me in this market, everything sells at a 13 times gross rent multiplier, right? Yes. So you take the income, you multiply it, and it gives you a value, right? Right. And I tell people, if you could buy in this 13 times, but under a smaller multiplier, mm -hmm. then we're making money. That's right. Right. So for me, and I'm going to tell you this, because a lot of people will ask me, when do you decide to buy? And there's probably two main factors that I that we've narrowed it down. If the cash on cash return is high, That's everything which no one ever even talks about cash on cash returns. They want to talk about cap rates. Cap rate is so... Uh, one Finer. year. Well, it's it's a 12 month period snapshot. And if you're going to make an investment on a on a 12 month period, you're going to own this for 20 years. That's right. Why would you ever make a decision off that? Right. So my thing is, if it's a cash on cash return that I think is sufficient, then mm -hmm. I go for it. And if I could buy into equity. Yeah. So anytime where I'm like, okay, I'm buying a property that's a million, but I know it's worth one 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 five. Mm -hmm. We're all over it. So. So cool. Let's talk about let's talk about cash flow and appreciation because that's probably the biggest mm -hmm. question I get. Yeah. Hey Juan, I've seen you. I've seen you on YouTube. I've seen you on Instagram. We're following you. We're learning from you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to buy in Southern California. The cap rate's so low, and I could buy so many more doors out of state. Mm -hmm. What do you say to that? I have gone really deep in that space because I had the same thing, and I've kind of come full circle with it because I purchased a lot out of state. We did a lot of syndications, some big deals. I sold a lot of my properties out of state last year mm -hmm. just because I wanted a whole lot of gunpowder for when this thing does actually move when I'm correct and not you know wrong. But for me, it depends, like the deal, it depends on what your model is for you and your family. What's your strategy? I like to do both. You're never going to get better appreciation than Southern California real estate. It's just a good market. It's gonna go up, it's a T1 city. If you look at just like the trajectory of real estate, I bought in so many buildings that were like 25 grand, uh, 70 grand, and now they're like 1.7, and this sweet old lady still owns it. Yeah. So I like those numbers. I also like the cash flow from out of state. That's what enticed me about six years to go out there. It was Cleveland, Ohio. I had a buddy of mine who was flipping houses out here. Mm -hmm. He went to Cleveland and never came back and was just buying tons of multifamily. So I finally went out there. I finally got my first deal, and I was like, this is a joke. I flew out there and I was like, I can't believe this is this inexpensive. The cash flow was bananas, it was through the roof. And I, I think all those properties have gone up maybe 3% the whole time. So there's no appreciation. The one reason why certain states are so great is they're landlord friendly states. Here in California, it is a nightmare to get people out. In Cleveland, it's $300 in 12 days. Wow. And it's, that's a sheriff lockout. Yeah. So, so let's go back to uh, what you just said. So after you probably made some wealth here, some appreciation, mm -hmm. and you had some money to invest, then you went out of state. Correct. Okay, right. I so okay. capital. Okay, so that's, that's an important thing to, to note. So here's what I've come up with because this question comes up all the time. Every single day. I it's get probably the number one question. Okay, so Agreed. Agreed. here's what I've come up with. If you have the time to wait, right? Because this is, this is uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's not get rich quick, it's get rich guaranteed. That's right. But it's 15, 20 year plan, right? Correct. So. I've told everyone is, is first, we're gonna invest for appreciation, all right? Mm -hmm. Cause that's where we're gonna build our wealth. That's the foundational piece. That's it, Agreed. we need that. Yeah. So then 20 years have passed, you're a little older, more sophisticated, you picked up more assets, then one by one start trading into out of state. Now we go cash flow. Correct. Because when you're younger, you may not need that cash flow. You're Correct. gonna have a salary, you have a career and everything else. And so you're a perfect example of that where you mm -hmm. made Money. Money. And then we go out of state. And then I started to experiment out of state. Here's what I really want to kind of like share with your entire audience. If you're a real estate professional, you're a real estate broker, or you're a real estate agent, and you're closing deals here in SoCal, and you own your house, and you're like, look, I'm never going to be able to buy something here. I just want to test the market. How about you take one of your twenty or thirty thousand dollar commission checks and go buy a duplex in Cleveland, Ohio, for seventy grand? Go put it down, like get a little bit of cash flow, feel what it feels like to be a landlord out of state. You might hate it. 
And instead of going all in out of state, plus you gotta fly there, you gotta drive the neighborhoods, you gotta walk the neighborhoods, you gotta feel into the communities. Do you know how inexpensive it is to fly to Cleveland, meet with a broker, meet with a property manager, fly home and have a really amazing perspective on what it's like to invest in that city? And it costs you like a thousand bucks to do all your due diligence, to build relationships, that's what we did. And it's worked out great, but like, you gotta just go and test it, just right. see. And, and, and I'm glad you said that. At this point where we're at, we're, we're very pro Long Beach, pro Southern California, mm. invest here, let's, let's get that appreciation. Again, I don't mind the low cap rate because that's, it's just a 12 month photo of what's going on with that asset. And so what you're talking about is going there, figuring out what the tenant base looks like, mm-hmm. what the rents go for, the vacancy rates, that's what you're doing. You're doing research. Absolutely. And I'm afraid that some of the folks that reach out to me aren't gonna do the research, they're just gonna go buy something based on, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm paying you know $50,000 a door or something. And they get mesmerized by this one metric. Correct. Not realizing that maybe vacancy there is 20%. Correct, and some places it is. And then certain places there, like the taxes are paid in the rears. Every single zip code has a different tax basis. Didn't know that when I got there. So certain areas, like it doesn't pencil at all, but the deal looks amazing on paper. It's those little nuances that you really have to get into. There was this one broker, she would not take me to the east side of Cleveland because it's ghetto and gangster there. I went there, it's like tree-lined streets, deer. I'm like, I'll take you to gangster. I'll take you to the hood. It was amazing. So we started buying where? East side. Got Eastside it. Cleveland. And then we started to exchange and move things over and into like some nicer areas. But we found that the rent basis there is about 450 to 800. Like that's the strike zone. Yeah. But it's also, there's a lot of vacancies. So if like you do get evicted, you just go to the building next door. So you yeah. have to take that into consideration. Right. It's not just the like, oh, I'm going to take my money out to Cleveland or out to Tennessee or out to KC and just make money. And that's why I'm such a big proponent of boots on the ground. Like I value deals and can bet them all day long on my computer. I stand and touch and feel every property I've ever purchased. You know, so Andy, you're the third person we've interviewed. And and the first two, Mark Milan, Brian McGinnis, their thing is I buy in state because I could go touch it. It's very important to be there, to see the tenants, to know that when there is a vacancy, there legitimately is a vacancy. Mm -hmm. And so, and so I, I think you're doing it the right way that if you're considering out of state that you are involved. It's not so much, hey, I'm gonna buy you out of state and I'll pretend like it doesn't exist and it performs the way it performs. Mm-hmm. You, you're not gonna win. It, this is a, it's kind of a contact sport. It's a very much a contact sport. You need to be sport. involved. Yeah. yeah, and you can do a lot of things now because of like, like the space now is digitalized, right? Like you can literally put out like an ad saying, hey, here's the six properties that you want mm-hmm. and you want photos of them. You can pay a kid 50 bucks to go shoot you real photos of real time of those properties and then report back to you. Yeah. Like there's so much you can do and it's not that expensive to fly. But it, you know, there's like an old school thing and that's what stopped me for so long to go out of state was like, if you can't drive there within two hours, don't buy it. That was like the old model. Yep. yep. It's somewhat changed. So like there's opportunities everywhere. You just have to be willing to do the work. Got it. No, I get it. Let's let's talk about, um, I guess another big question is, is uh, are we in a bubble? Mm. When's the market gonna crash? Mm-hmm. Everyone's asking us, mm-hmm. they're asking you, it, it, yep. the residential, multifamily, commercial. What are your thoughts on that? I've been wrong, like I was saying before. Here's what I know for sure. I know that in the history of the globe, the market has never gone up forever. There is always right. some kind of correction. If you study the history of real estate, as I do like a crazy person, it's never a dip, it's never a correction. Those are cycles within cycles. Right. Crashes are exactly what they are. Mm-hmm. They're a crash. In my opinion, this is the first time that we have like kind of a tech bubble, kind of like a stock market bubble, kind of a student loan debt problem crisis in the trillions bubble. We just printed $5 trillion to devalue the I mean. There's a lot of things and factors. Here's the other thing, no one cares. Like people are still buying like crazy people. Interest rates are the lowest in our country's history and we have the supply and demand issue. You have an entire generation that's waiting longer to get into deals. Some of them are actually buying duplexes and triplexes now instead of condos or houses as their first investment pieces. So like there's a lot of support to keep this market going. I don't see something pushing it down. So I'm just cautious. I think we're in this constant state of a bubble. It just takes something usually really big to kind of push it over the edge. But what I've learned over this, you know, past whatever 12, 13 years is 
you have to be cautious, but you have to behave within the market that you're in. And that's what I didn't do for three years. I mean, I literally passed on some amazing deals yeah. because I was like, ooh, it's been 10 years. Right. And I was wrong. We interviewed Brian uh, two weeks ago. What Brian McGinnis said mm-hmm. was, he said, I'm not smart enough to follow the cycles and I'm not gonna make a decision based on what may or may not happen. Mm-hmm. He said, if I'm in a position to buy real estate, I buy it. I buy it. That's it. And so, right, and so that's what I tell my clients is like, okay, Interest rates are really, really good. Mm-hmm. Okay, inventory has gone down. You know, all over with most asset types. Agreed. So it's getting a little tougher. But what I tell folks is, if you buy something that has thirty-year financing, so four units and less, you know, obviously we make a big push for the fourplex. Although the values might drop if they do, the rents typically stay consistent. Agreed. The rents pay the mortgage. That's right. You're safe in Southern California. Vacancy is literally zero. Mm-hmm. Right. And someone yep. moves out, and someone, even before you put the for rent sign outside. The neighbors have found out that there's a vacancy coming and mm-hmm. they get your number. They're calling you before the tenants even moved out. Yes. I mean, it's, it's, that's, that's what I know. Um, so I always tell people when you're buying a small apartment building, you're buying a business mm-hmm. that you don't have to go to every day. Right. You don't have to check in every day. Maybe right. once a month, maybe once a week. Uh, maybe sometimes there's three months you don't check on it. But the day you close escrow, if you had a vacancy, there's a line waiting outside and you never announced it. I mean, it's kind of a beautiful thing in terms of a business. And I think people need to look at it as a business Agreed. because that's really what it is. And so going back to, if you could buy something, do it. Mm-hmm. And then going back to everything in Southern California, it seems to double every 10 to 12 years on average. Mm-hmm. We're in a safe position. And that's, sometimes they're just basic metrics. And I don't let all this craziness going on in the news affect what we're doing or affect the advice that we're giving our clients. For sure. And it's the it's the safest vehicle that I've found for my family's money and for all my investors' money. I mean, and I've looked at it all and I completely agree with you. So like, who cares if the market takes a dip, you lose a little bit like on paper, yeah. you still have a full like, you know, rack of like tenants basically paying for your asset, taxes and expenses, even if your cash flowing a little bit. I'm third generation Long Beach. The rents in Long Beach are crazy right now. They're not going down. They're not gonna go down. We're seeing a massive push from Santa Monica, Manhattan, Redondo, people moving to Long Beach because of like the beach, the art, the restaurants, the lifestyle, everything, and you're still 20, 30 minutes from work. So like, I think Long Beach is gonna continue to grow as the city grows with like the ADUs. I mean, there's so much growth potential here. I would be looking heavily to Long Beach as an investor. Yeah, so one of the things, and I obviously we, we love Long Beach, we do. You know, we're, we do. we're with you. So um, Long Beach is considered the last affordable beach city. Agreed. It's the last affordable beach city, you know, the, the walkability, the lifestyle. And so we're always promoting Long Beach and we do, you know, we, we are getting investors from mm-hmm. out of the area. Hey, we typically would only invest here, but now we're looking at Long Beach and I think that's a safe play. Agreed. Yeah. Let's talk about um, what, what makes a successful investor. Mm. So you've done it. You've done a little bit of everything, you know, out of state, flipping homes. What, what's it take to, to get started? Like you have to fall in love with the numbers. It's just, I mean, this is a numbers game. This is not like an emotional game. I've literally talked people out of deals because I'm like, I don't care if you've always wanted this beautiful Spanish duplex in the shore. Mm. This thing couldn't pencil on its best day. Right. But I've always wanted. I'm like, then I can't help you. Like, I'm here to help you make money. This is not going to make money. So for me, you have to kind of love real estate too. I mean, there's there's like a love affair that has to happen because it is hard. It is like it is work. And as soon as it gets to a certain point, it's kind of a set it. But at the same time, to make a good investor, it's the same thing with anything. I think you have to love it a little bit. You have to be okay with it's not going to be a home run every time. And that was hard for me because, you know, for four years straight, I couldn't miss. And then you miss a couple of times and you're like, oh, I'm vulnerable. You're like, oh, I can take a punch, you know? And then, but that's when you actually grow. I don't learn anything from my wins. I learn everything from, you know, those losses and those L's. I also get around people that are so much smarter than me. Like all my mentors are so much more superior and, you know, they're just seasoned. And like you, I'm sure, I follow what they do. If, if you've seen four cycles and you're still in business, you're doing something right. Right. And a lot of it's walking versus running. Right. And, it's, and so this is the reason for one of these shows is let's learn from people that are, that are making the right moves. Yeah. And again, not everyone makes every right move. Of course. You know, you're going to win, you're going to lose. But ultimately, the, uh, the goal of, listen, we're all doing this for, um, 
We want passive income. Yep. We want to be able to retire someday, right? That's why we're doing it. Freedom, right? Like this, this whole thing with yeah. investing is, is absolutely freedom based. Most of our investors are doctors, lawyers, surgeons, like, you know, dentists, they have a profession that eats up most of their time. Yeah. So they can't really spend their money. Yeah. They're too busy in their field and their practice. So we help them make money by buying buildings. And that works really, really well for a lot of people. So I don't know, for me, it's just a, it's just a really good place to park your money. I'm a, I'm a multifamily nerd. <laughs> well, that's all we have here today. <laughs> Let's talk about, you know, you, you brought up rent control, eviction moratorium. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people will call me and say, mm -hmm. I want to buy, but rent control scares me. Eviction mm -hmm. moratorium scares me. Like, what do you tell them in terms of like, still move forward with something? Sure. There are tons of opportunities everywhere. If somebody freaks out because of rent control, because they're maybe like a little bit senior, and they've been worried about this for four decades and it finally passed. Mm -hmm. So there's an opportunity for you to maybe buy that property from them. So that's an opportunity for maybe a young buck to take on that you know, new risk and responsibility. Yeah. So maybe we can set up a special deal with them with some seller financing. Now we're doing creative deal structures mm -hmm. because of rent control. Everybody's like doom, gloom, rent control. I'm like, oh, I went to town. As soon as that thing passed, I couldn't send out enough mail. Yeah. Hey, did you hear what happened? Just wanna let you guys know what happened in California. You own stuff all over the country. So for me, there's opportunities. If you're new, it's a real fear. I mean, yeah, it is. it's yeah. it's a legitimate thing. So when we were flipping houses, I got really good at cash for keys. I got really good at rent control law because we were flipping a lot in Los Angeles. I got really good at writing checks for $18,678, which was the cap per unit. And I was just like, that had to factor into my deal. So. So I never let that stop me from buying a deal because if it pencils, it pencils. Even if I have to like, get everybody out, cash for keys. Yeah. It's a real thing, but you have to have somebody who's a professional like Juan, like myself, who knows how to talk to a tenant how, like, and just how to structure the deal where it's going to work. Every tenant is furious when the property gets sold. Mm -hmm. Every tenant, it's just, so what I do is, it's fear. They're not really mad. They're not angry at me. Yeah. They hang up on me, all this other stuff. They're afraid. So I get to that core part of them that's afraid for their family, afraid they're going to have to move. And I go, listen, we're going to work this out. I change my tonality. I get down to their level. I start talking about my past, how like I was raised really poor. You know, I, you know, I moved 26 times in Long Beach. Like, you know, I just, I can relate to them. And now we're having a conversation around what's possible. Right. And then, but that part's important because I love those opportunities. Most investors are like, oh, it has tenants right now, I'm over it. But that's where you can get a great deal. Right. Possibly. Yeah, yeah. You talked about areas that you like to invest in. For, for our viewers out there, you know, you're, this is third generation Long Beach, you know Long Beach well. What, mm -hmm. what parts of Long Beach do you see opportunities right now when it comes to multifamily? Sure, like the whole strip. There's this middle zone, 7th Street to like Anaheim from, I mean, pretty much Redondo to Long Beach Boulevard. Okay. There's a really cool stretch there. It's been fun for me to watch this entire transition of Long Beach, mm -hmm. but there's also huge opportunities from like Broadway to 6th and 7th. Yeah. You know, there's just, there's, there's so much product here. And why don't you tell our viewers, like, what is it that you're seeing? Like, sure. So, I mean, you're here boots on the ground. You live here. Absolutely. You know? uh, like, what are you seeing in those areas so that it's not coming from me? Like, no, you know, absolutely. I'm, I'm selling it all the time, but like, what is it that you're seeing that you like? So it's the, so it's the same thing that we saw in certain parts of Los Angeles, certain parts of East LA. You saw certain places that were like a little hood, a little sketchy at nighttime, to then like yoga mats, fixed gears, and farmer's markets. So like those are those little markers that we look for. And it's the same across the whole country. Like those are things that I'm like, they just put in a Trader Joe's? I'm like, interesting. I try to find that stuff out before it goes in, obviously, yeah. Yeah. so we can buy way ahead of time, but I look for just like, what's the demographic doing? Is the demographic coming in or is the demographic going out? Where's the gentrification happening? Gentrification is always happening all over the place. Where is it and where does it make sense? Yeah. Like there was a 10 unit building that we bought off of 10th Street God, probably nine years ago. Every unit was a drug dealer, mm -hmm. every single one. We slowly got them all out. That thing now is like got like, like the slat wooded fence, it's like hipsterville with like all this stuff. And I was just like, this block was very different, you know, like nine years ago. We, and so 
We call that the hipster fence. When it we is. See it. It's yep. a hipster fence and it does look good. No, it's all over East LA. I mean, that was the model that we used to use. Yeah. We would literally put that thing in there and it would be like right next to like a full blown like crack house. And then you'd have hipster fence with the big numbers. Yeah. And it works. Yeah. And so, and so the areas that you're describing would be maybe like what, maybe like Midtown, Mid City, we would call here in Long Beach. Yep. And so, we sell those areas. And so th those areas, the best way to describe them, it's in the path of growth. Mm. And there's something that's been going on in the city of Long Beach where the tenant base wants uh, walkability. Yes. They want lifestyle, right? And so where, where can I ride my bike? Where can I get a coffee? Mm. Where can I go to the, um, you know, the bookstore or where can I hang out? Where's mm -hmm. the park? They love that. And so when we're looking at buildings now, and it's important for an investor to know this because ultimately you want to position the property you're doing this as a business, right? And Absolutely. so you're doing this so that you can maximize the rent you want to bring, you want to make this. And so the, like the, what some of these buildings, what you're really selling, it's not so much the building. We want the building to be nice, mm -hmm. which what's good is a lot of people are improving their properties. And I think it's a really good thing for the city of Long Beach and it ultimately has a domino effect on other buildings, right? Agreed. And so, but what you're selling is a lifestyle to the tenants right. and the tenants sign up for that lifestyle. They stay put long-term tenants, everyone wins. And so that's kind of what we're seeing is where uh, people will use the word that Long Beach has got this uh, eclectic feel to it. And it does, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and not to mention it's proximity to typically we'll get couples in where one works downtown LA, one works in Orange County. That's right. Long Beach is right in the middle. It's like the perfect city. So yes. um, it's still in the path of growth. Mm -hmm. I personally like North Long Beach. Me too. You know, we have the lab coming, mm -hmm. which is kind of a big secret. They haven't broken ground yet. Yep. That is going to completely transform that area. That completely whole zone in Wrigley. Uh, so like there was a house that we flipped there about a year ago. I could have never imagined that it was going to sell for what it did. And I was like, we're in, and it was, it was on an okay street at best. Yeah. And we knocked it out of the park. And then I started to walk the area and I was like, oh, that's why. Everything was changing yeah. quickly. I, I totally agree with you. All yeah. of North Long Beach. Here's the cool part about Long Beach. You have a beach from downtown to the end of the city, which is like the peninsula in Naples. You could buy a building that might only be three blocks from the ocean, but it's close to downtown. People like that proximity to the beach. And I don't know, there's just, there's so much potential here. I love it, I love it. So who we have is upcoming investors, mm -hmm. seasoned investors, sure. a lot of uh, mom and pop independent owners that are trying to figure out what do I do next? Do sure. I, do I refinance? Do I buy something else? Juan, do I stay put? Like what's any advice that you want to give to those folks that are just involved? They want to just want to learn. Sure. Do what's best for you and your family and get a clear plan with a professional like somebody like Juan and paint a picture. We have clients for life. Like that's my whole goal. Like we have plans for five years, 10 years, 20 years. We're more of like an investment strategy house similar to you. So, if you're new and you're thinking about, I've got so much equity in my house, should I yank out two or 300 grand? Should I buy something with Juan? The answer is yes. But here's what I want you to do is like, listen to podcasts, read books, get like your head around what you're doing. So then you come to Juan armed with like what you're doing. So you don't get stuck in this like, I don't know if I should or not. Because yeah. when he says go, you're gonna have to go and go quickly, right? Especially in this market. Got it. So, so that brings me to my rapid fire questions. Uh, you talked about books right now. Mm -hmm. uh, what's what's your favorite book? The one you outside of your own, right. outside of your own right. book. Which actually, I, let me get into your book real quick because sure. I didn't get a chance to get. Yeah, you're good. Okay, so 100 Doors. Mm -hmm. Explain the concept behind the 100 Doors because a lot of times clients will call me and they'll say, um, "I want to own so many doors," right? Mm -hmm. And so it it could be that maybe you put that in you know in, in their mindset. So explain sure. what that is and kind of the thought process behind that. Sure. So I love this book. It's very easy to read. It's only a hundred pages. Here's this book right here, hundred doors, super thin, has me on the back, cash flow is king. This is like the follow-up book to Rich Dad Poor Dad. If you haven't read that book, totally changed my life. Sure. Amazing, amazing real estate book. This puts all those principles into practice for the two, three, and four model. This book covers the duplex, triplex, fourplex. That's where my heart's at. I love that model. So I was raised again, super poor by a single mom. If she would have known that she could put 3.5% down on a duplex or triplex or fourplex in Long Beach, live in the front house, rent out the other three units to cover almost the entire mortgage, her life would look very different at 72 right now. And my life growing up would have looked very different. So for all the single moms or single dads or just families out there trying to figure it out, on a $700,000 duplex, your down payment is 7, 14, 21. It's like 
$23,000 you put down and you're now living in this asset. You're paying yourself rent. You're becoming a landlord yourself. You're, you're, you're in the game. Yeah. You have a foundational piece. And for me, that's super important for people to get through their heads. If you're in your 20s, don't buy a condo, don't buy a house, buy a multi-unit first, two, three, or four. Use this model and then suck out 100 grand in a couple of years and buy a house. And then if you have a triplex and a three bedroom, two bath house for your family or whatever, and that's all you did for 20 years, your life looks very different. So for some of you who hear this and say, can you do that now? So we represented a client on a, on a three unit building four years ago. Now they've, so they bought this property. It wasn't in the best area, mm -hmm. but, but they bought it. They fixed it up. They live there. Mm -hmm. We're now helping them buy their second property. This is like young couple. Yeah. They're going to get $2,000 from that property, passive income. Yep. Once they move out and they, and they lease it up mm -hmm. and they're like, Wow, that's passive. This is being done now. It's being I, done now. I was get goosebumps even talking about yeah. this stuff. It's real and it's so important because yeah. nobody is talking about it enough. And I cannot shut my mouth about it. Yeah. I, I'm trying to tell everybody. Check out 100 Doors. Check out the book. Good information there. It's, it's, backed, it's backed by data. It's backed by knowledge and experience. You're not just out there talking about it. You're, you're doing it. No, these are real life it's stories. Real life stories. Yeah. Let's talk about the book. You said Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Would you say that's your best book? If someone says, Andy, I only got time to read one book. What, what's the book you recommend that I should check out? That is the book for real estate. Yeah. It's super easy to read. Again, I'm not that bright. I fully understood the book. I can tell you exactly where I was on these long bike rides when I had these like crazy moments of like, that's, that's real? You could do that? Yeah. Why doesn't everybody do that? It is a must read for got sure. It. Got it. No, and I agree. And I love the book. Yeah, and I, and I got a chance to read it like right after college. So yeah. early on and I got to... Uh, breathe it, live it, and yep. then kind of experience it with the mentors that I've had. Speaking of mentors, what's the best advice that you've ever been given? Man, there's a laundry list. I would say uh, walk. Like when you're walking is a, is a really good way to win it's with whatever you're doing. I am wired to go really fast. So I have to really, really be mindful of that. And for me, it's like I just do a lot of research and I walk. Like literally walk, you just go outside and walk and just... No, I mean like, cause I get so ahead of myself sometimes, yeah. I'll get way too quick. Like, like, oh, I just flipped a house, I'm gonna flip 25. Got it. I'm like one at a time, So patience. you're saying it, yes, patience. slow it down, yes. slow it down, got yeah. it. And there's time, I had, I literally was broke, broke, almost no more money left 12 years ago. Now I'd never have to work another day in my life, my family totally said it. So like, you just, it's all possible. Like, it's just. Got it, got it. Well, thank you so much. Thanks, Andy bro. Dane Carter, thank you for being here. Love Thanks, it. Juan, appreciate it, brother. All right, everyone, so that was our interview with Andy Dane Carter. Uh, my main takeaways are, he's done a good job of creating wealth here, whether it was flipping, investing in smaller, you know, two to four units in the city of Long Beach and in, in Southern California. But once he did that, you know, he found a vehicle out of state where he was gonna go and buy units, and so, taking us to the buy for equity first, cash flow second, kind of really confirmed or solidified the advice that I've been giving you folks is that that is the two prong approach, equity growth first, cash flow next. One thing he said is when you consider out of state, because a lot of our clients do, is go do your homework. You know, he's not hiring a broker saying, hey, I'll buy this for uh, because it gives that rate of return. He's out there, flying out there, knocking on doors, boots on the ground, doing his research, trying to figure out, are there a lot of vacancy signs outside? Who are the property managers here? Who are the brokers here? He's putting in the work to make sure he makes that educated decision. And I think that's really, really important. And for those folks that are considering out of state, I would consider doing, you know, putting that much work into before you ever invest in any market. Because guess what? Every market is so different. Another takeaway was he's a big proponent of single moms or people, I guess, believing in themselves that they could actually do this. And, you know, obviously we're here, long, you know, here with our company, we're creating this community of, of investors and we're teaching them that it can be done. And it's nice that, that Andy shares that same mentality. You know, he having a single mom, it is possible to buy a two unit, a three unit, a four unit. All of that is possible. People are doing this every day. And the fact that he's uh, shedding light on it, that it is possible, I think it's really nice. He is talking about when you're looking to invest, look in properties where you see a, a little bit of change in the neighborhood. Things in neighborhoods that were a little tough, maybe they're getting a little nicer. Look into those areas. That does make sense, right? Because it uh, shows you that people are investing in those properties, setting up that domino effect of properties getting better. And he also 
touched on uh, whether we're on a bubble or not. You know, he said it's kind of tough to say. You know, nothing goes up forever. He's absolutely right. And so it's kind of hard to time. But right now, uh, there's a lot of positivity uh, in the economy, in the real estate market. And so he doesn't expect this massive crash, maybe a correction. And I think that's important for people to know because there's a lot of fear or uncertainty about that right now. If you enjoyed the video, make sure to like it. If you have any questions, please leave a comment below. And to make sure to not miss out on our next video, please hit the subscribe button. That's it, I'll see you next time.